All right, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jesse Jossos. I'm uh, uh, here, here from Jamf, and I uh, just want to welcome you all to JNUC, uh, probably for the fifth or fiftieth time. Uh, today we have um, Matt Taylor here. Um, he is going to talk to us about security um, and, and, and management and a whole lots of fun things. Uh, and so we're going to be able to have some Q&A. Um, and so quick note about Q&A before we get started. Um, this year, everyone here at Austin can participate in the Q&A by using the JNUC app. And so take a minute, if you, if you have that app, to open it up. Um, choose the session Q&A from the app. Um, locate the session from the list and start submitting enough voting questions as you have them on the fly. Uh, and so you can also opt out questions that you think are relevant and that you would like to see um, bring to the top of the list. And if we have uh, a limited amount of time, we'll, we'll go in order of those most upvoted. So our virtual attendees can also join in as well, asking questions directly from the session page. And your submitted questions will help fuel the Q&A portion of this, this segment. So um, thank you so much for coming. Um, and without further ado, Matt. Thank you very much, Jesse. Welcome to JNUC 2023, again, uh, 51st time. My name is Matt Taylor. Uh, I'm a product manager here at Jamf. Hopefully the click is working. Fantastic. Uh, and we're going to be talking a little bit today around defending Max with management-led security. Uh, I'm in the product team, as I mentioned, focus on the Apple endpoint security space. And my job as a product manager here at Jamf is to really talk to as many customers, other vendors and partners and just general people in the market to really uh, understand what do customers want our help with the most? You know, what are the biggest problems people are struggling with uh, within the space of endpoint security that Jamf should be trying to help them with? Now, on the screen, uh, we've got trusted access. I'm guessing that's a brand new concept to everyone in the audience. No one's ever heard it before, uh, or rather the opposite. Uh, we are definitely big on this at the moment. Uh, and I, just because of that, I want to make sure I kind of root the presentation uh, within the understanding of trusted access and what it is. Uh, it's a solution that's built upon a foundation of device management principles and capabilities, employing modern identity, security, and access to solve our customers' two most pressing problems. How do we keep organizational data safe while ensuring that users remain productive and really importantly engaged no matter where they are or what devices they're working from. Now, trusted access is a desired end state, you know, but it's also vital to remember that each one of these interconnected pieces is really valuable in and of itself. Uh, progressing each one of these independent of the others uh, bolsters the security posture of your environment. So it's important to not just look at this as a, you know, a one and done or we can only get uh, an improvement once we achieve all of these, but by tackling each one of these independent chunks, we can do some good. I do want to focus on some uh, very specific ones, uh, and those are protecting endpoints and preventing threats. And importantly, we're actually going to do so by first having a review of the threat landscape for Mac devices, the wider cybersecurity landscape in the last year or so, highlighting some of the key initial attack vectors that we see attackers using, and covering what's possible today for protecting devices, as well as what Jamf is doing to help. Now, one thing I just want to uh, really hit home on is the key to the, the content here and what I want everyone to take away is that we're chasing the highest value, lowest effort opportunities in defending your Macs. You know, every, every, it's probably cliche to say it at this point, everyone is trying to do more with less. So what can we do, what can Jamf do, what can you do with the solutions to try to have the biggest bang for buck, right? How can you increase the security posture of your environment with the least amount of effort as possible? Uh, these are the things that we'll run through. And underpinning all of this and allowing us to uh, perform that analysis of the threat landscape is uh, our threat research group within Jamf called Jamf Threat Labs. Uh, these are the folks that make possible uh, everything that we'll run through, the threat protection that we're providing to thousands of Jamf customers worldwide and across all sections of the market every day. Uh, it's their job to continuously hunt for vulnerabilities, uh, research new or existing threats, uh, data exposures, and their primary goal is really to build up the security capability of Jamf products, but also the general security posture of Apple and mobile platforms uh, in aid of defenders tasked with protecting them. <laughs> it's got a big uh, thumbs of approval from the leader of our Threat Labs team over there. Uh, was that good? Nailed it? Fan fantastic. 
Uh, the group is comprised of threat researchers, uh, experts within the cybersecurity space, data scientists, uh, with skills that span penetration testing, network monitoring, uh, malware reverse engineering and analysis, app risk assessments. Plug all that in with our machine learning engine, Miriam, and the 20 plus years of experience that Jamf can really bring to the table with regards to the platforms, and you do end up with something really quite special. Now, the threat landscape of Mac is continuously evolving, uh, as it is for every other platform out there, but we have identified some key trends that we're wanting to share. Uh, our intention with this review is to not invoke fear, okay? This is not about spreading fear, uncertainty, and doubt. We're not in the business of doing that, uh, but instead to educate uh, our customers and your users on what options you have available and how to best keep all aspects of uh, device, user, and organizational data secure. And we'll dive in. Now, on the screen, you can see threat detections on Mac by Jam Protect with the threat intelligence from Threat Labs, lots of the same words there, over the first half of 2023. Now, across the industry, we actually saw a reduction in Mac malware, and, or, uh, rather, of Mac uh, malware infections by 30%, which is actually really fantastic news. Uh, it tends to be swings and roundabouts. Some years it will go up, some years it will go down, depending on what's popular with attackers uh, at the time. Uh, interestingly, though, Mac-specific infections actually remain steady with what we saw. So relative to the rest of the industry, uh, the percentage of malware infections actually grew on Mac. Now, the number one threat targeting Mac still is malicious uh, advertising or adware. You might also hear it referred to. Uh, this is unwanted software that uh, infiltrates devices with the goals of forcefully uh, advertising to the user to generate per-click ad revenue. Uh, while typically uh, not as dangerous as many other types of malware, it's very invasive of privacy, you know, uh, records a lot of internet usage activity on the device, often makes unwanted changes to the host, uh, specifically most commonly around browser settings. Uh, importantly, it's, it's commonly a potential gateway to other more malicious or more nefarious things that the user might be either tricked into downloaded or just downloaded as part of the general usage of that software. Uh, it's... Uh, you know, while these risks aren't perhaps as uh, concerning as something like uh, spyware, for example, that we see much more on the mobile platform, blocking of this malicious advertising still plays a key role in defending your endpoints, protecting the digital experience of your end users, as well as just main uh, maintaining good device and network hygiene. Positioned at number five, uh, we had a rather significant supply chain attack uh, occur for the first time, or rather appearing on this list for the first time, dubbed uh, Smooth Operator. This attack has been attributed to the Lazarus Group, uh, believed to be a North Korean state-sponsored threat actor, uh, which is basically a group of attackers who are financed and supported by a nation state. Uh, it effectively means they have almost unlimited resources at their disposal in some cases. Uh, in our estimation, Lazarus Group is the number one state-sponsored threat actor act actively targeting Mac at the moment. We see a lot of uh, uh, things attributed to them. They are particularly financially motivated. Uh, we have some great talks this week that are actually going to go into these folks in a lot more detail and actually dissect a few of the attacks by Lazarus groups. So I highly recommend checking those out. Uh, a supply chain attack, for those of you who don't know, is say I'm a threat actor and I have a target organization over there that I want to compromise. But that target organization has a very high security posture. They're very difficult, to me, uh, difficult for me to breach, very expensive, very time consuming, high chance of being detected. That's obviously challenging, it's gonna cost me a lot, they're not the easiest target, but I still need to get in there. So rather than go and attack them directly, I might find who else is in their supply chain, what software do they use internally within their business, maybe I can go and compromise one of those vendors instead, and then leverage that inherent trust between supply chain vendors to then down the, uh, travel down the supply chain and then infiltrate my actual target organization. So in this case, it was a, um, a VoIP software provider, 3CX. It was actually mentioned in the keynote earlier today, uh, where there was Trojanized applications that were uh, successfully signed and actually notarized by Apple, uh, and just as proof that built-in security is really important, but no security is infallible. Uh, and it's the first confirmed chaining of supply chain attacks in that the vendor itself that was the target of the, of the initial attack was itself compromised by a previous supply chain attack. Uh, really interesting, uh, and again, I think there is a talk on this as well, uh, but something that I think we can expect to see more of in the industry uh, as, as we see more and more attackers trying to 
kind of infiltrate specific businesses through whatever means that they can. I'm not very up, up on the clicking today. Oh, there we go. Uh, sorry, the click is a little bit delayed. Uh, there we go. Uh, so what jumps out to me when, when kind of looking at this and, and looking at all the threat research that we pulled to create these slides, uh, we hear a lot about you know, the market share that Windows devices have and the market share that Mac devices have. Attackers, at the end of the day, operate like a business, okay? So just like Jamf does, just like many people in this organization do, we're all trying to uh, essentially generate revenue, right, to make money. Attackers operate that way as well. So often, attackers will choose the best target, the cheapest target to attack, or the thing that will generate the most revenue. Historically, that has been Windows, just because the market share is so much bigger, but that is changing, okay? So as we saw on the keynote earlier, and as we've seen over the last couple of years, the Windows market share is diminishing and the Apple platform's market share is increasing. And with that increase, we are seeing more attacks targeting these platforms than ever. Each, in, in every single one of these situations where an attacker actually chose to target the Apple platform, they chose to target that over another platform. Okay, so they chose not to spend that money, they chose not to invest that money targeting Windows or Android or Linux, they went to target an Apple platform. So. Uh, for a long time, there's been this understanding that Apple platforms don't get malware. Uh, that's not true. They do. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't things that we can do about them, and particularly that Apple is doing about it as well. Now, uh, for the second time today, a rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, what we can see here happily is that the response from the security, uh, security industry, from vendors and from threat researchers, is positive. Right? Things are trending in a good direction. In 2022, we saw uh, quite a bit less than half of the uh, mal confirmed malicious files that our Threat Labs team caught with Jam Protect were actually uh, unknown to virus total, right? So less than half were completely unknown to virus total, uh, in that we were catching things that other vendors weren't, all right? And we're just a single vendor, okay? So that's, that, that's really, really significant. In that year following, there was an increase of 19%. So now that more than half of the things that we detect through Jam Threat Labs and Jam Protect are detected as, uh, or are detected by other vendors on virus total. So this is positive, right? This is a really big, difficult problem. The more people that are trying to tackle uh, threats targeting these platforms, the better. Uh, the more brain power, the better. And in fact, our threat labs team often, often actually collaborate with our direct competitors behind the scenes, right? We're all trying to work towards this same thing of uh, protecting our customers who are using Apple platforms. Unfortunately, though, uh, or I mean, perhaps kind of fortunately for Jamf in some ways, uh, even if something is detected on virus total or it's known to virus total, it doesn't mean that it's actually detected as malicious. So uh, for those of you who don't know, virus total is an online repository that threat researchers use to upload uh, suspicious or malicious files, other indicators of compromise to help the general security industry understand and track uh, attacks that are being found. Uh, and one third of things that were known to virus total that were detected and caught by threat labs were still not detected as malicious by any of the vendors that had their detection engine integrated. And what that means is that somewhere, someone along the line has said, this file is suspicious. We found this. We think something's going on here, but we don't know for sure. So it's been uploaded to virus total, and no one has been able to confirm that that is actually malicious, okay? Still, in a lot of cases, in almost 40% of cases, things that we're catching on the Mac, file-based uh, ind indicators of compromise, are undetected by virus total, either as suspicious or malicious. That's huge, right? That's, that's, that's unfortunate. Um, but to me, that says that as an industry, we have, a, we have a lot of maturing to do. It is getting better. Things are, tr are trending in the right direction. Vendors are paying more attention. But there's still a lot of things happening behind the scenes that that uh, the, the kind of general public isn't aware of. And if we then kind of break that out, about half of things that we're catching with Threat Labs and Threat Protect are either undetected entirely or at least not detected with high confidence as malicious. Threat actors are early to act, they're fast to respond, uh, and have a growing uh, incentive to invest more resources as the years go by and as Apple continues to take an increasing portion of the desktop market share. One kind of final thing that happened in the space in the last 12 months that's uh, noticeable. Sorry, the clicker is painful. 
we saw the first Apple platform payload from a large ransomware as a service gang. Uh, the first kind of uh, actual piece of malware that was developed by one of these um, ransomware as a service gangs, which effectively means that they create ransomware and often, or in many cases, rather than actually going to uh, infect a, or compromise a corporation or an organization on their own, they'll have an affiliate program where they'll actually work with someone who will go to them and say, hey, I think I can actually compromise this organization. Give me a copy of your ransomware. And if anyone who doesn't know, ransomware is essentially malware that will encrypt some of the disk or all of the disk on the computer and require you to essentially give them money in order to actually uh, get the decryption keys. Uh, and then this person will take the ransomware that they get from this gang and actually go and compromise an organization. The gang will collect the revenue from that and they'll split that with the affiliate, all right? So it's a fantastic business, uh, a fantastic business model because it's reduced risk for the gang. Uh, they have little to no work, and someone else takes much of the risk, and they still generate about 40 to 50 percent of the profits. Uh, Lockbit is uh, one, one of the oldest ransomware as a service gangs uh, uh, in the world, um, and uh, this payload was first detected kind of late 2022, we think. Uh, it's only Apple, Apple Silicon hardware so far. Uh, and really, really importantly, the payload has not been weaponized, or at least the samples that have uh, been leaked have not been weaponized, in that uh, there's some functionality there to indicate that Lockbit is definitely interested in this area, right? They're playing with it, they're generating samples that will run on these operating systems or on these devices, but they're not yet fully equipped for actual deployment and usage. And again, really importantly, this hasn't actually been reported in the wild yet, so no one that we know of has been affected by this. Uh, but it's another example of these, these, these threat actors operating as a business and will chase the largest you know, financial opportunity. If, an organ if a, you know, a vendor like Lockbit is creating this, that's resources they're diverting away from things that they could be creating for the Windows platform. Now, we've kind of run through some general landscape uh, information. Now we'll look at in initial attack vectors, how attackers are generally getting onto devices in that uh, in initial stage of the attack. And probably no, no surprise here for many people, users continue to be the weakest link in any defense in that it's, it's not their fault. You know, users aren't trained to be cybersecurity professionals. Uh, it's very, very difficult sometimes to understand is this a safe or a malicious link. Uh, it's our job as defenders and as people in security and IT to prepare our end users, whether that's putting in systems in place to protect them or their devices or to train them to understand uh, what something uh, looks like if it's safe or if it's unsafe. We found that 31% of organizations had a user fall victim to a phishing attack in 2022. Like, that's huge, right? Uh, can I get everyone to put up their hands if they've received a phishing something, whether it's SMS, email, in the last month. Keep them up if it was two weeks. Keep them up if it was within the last week. Keep them up if it was in the last three days, right? That's a lot of people still, just in three days. I got a couple just yesterday uh, from two different numbers. So it's, they're everywhere, like we're, we're getting this a lot and they're getting smarter. So hi historically it's been just over email, sometimes SMS. Often now I get them over Instagram quite a lot. Like attackers are adapting and they're changing platform depending on the audience. Uh, importantly, one thing that we're seeing here is that um, uh, not many vendors are actually tackling the problem of kind of zero day attacks in that they're uh, domains that people have never seen before. They're particularly hard to detect. In 2022, we found 120,000 detected and prevented zero-day uh, zero phishing attacks. Top five types of phishing that we still tend to see, uh, probably no surprise for everyone, email is still number one. Uh, I think one that really stood out to me was number five, which was highly targeted in that it's not just a shotgun approach where we send a mass communication to everyone. Threat actors take the time to actually understand the profile of the person they're targeting and tailor the phishing attack to that person, to their profile. Um, so it's, it's a lot more time and investment, but that's number five on a list, right? Like that's, that's not low, so it shows that that time is time well spent. Good opportunity to talk about some important kind of built-in security that Apple's putting into the operating systems here, and we're swapping over to social engineering here, kind of the number two initial attack vector. Uh, Apple invests a ton of time and effort and resources in making sure these operating systems are as secure as possible out of the box. 
uh, from Gatekeeper with their code signing checks, really trying to ensure that only trusted software is running on the device. Uh, malware scanning with notarization, which is effectively a global block listing feature, where as soon as Apple is able to detect a developer signing certificate is malicious, they can just stop that being used worldwide as soon as devices have an internet connection. Really, really powerful tools that Apple is investing time in making sure these are protecting the users. Uh, Xprotect has been bolstered uh, with some proactive threat scans for the first time in the last year or so, uh, going from being a very kind of uh, reactive and only scanning when invoked tool to uh, actually trawling the operating system on a, on a schedule to try to make sure that uh, malicious files are being identified and isolated as soon as possible. And Apple is also really importantly democratizing threat protection on macOS with the Endpoint Security API. Uh, where they are trying to make it as easy and as accessible as possible for vendors like Jamf to build really powerful endpoint security protection for Mac. Uh, unlike the MDM framework, though, it is very much a, it's a data stream and a set of capabilities the vendors have to create their use cases, okay? Which is great for a vendor like Jamf because we can bring all that expertise to bear, um, but it, it does mean it's, it's perhaps more challenging in some ways than with the MDM framework, but it does mean that Apple's really opening the platform and making it possible to, to bring these devices into the arms of enterprise with vendors like Jamf making that possible. Strong foundations are really, really effective, but they're not perfect, right? Uh, everything has faults. Uh, in, in this particular case, we can see even on a device which has gatekeeper turned on to not allow users to bypass, uh, users can actually still bypass in some cases. And what we actually see is threat actors quite commonly are actually taking advantage of this, where rather than having to develop any special code, right, rather than having to develop any way to bypass Gatekeeper themselves, they'll include instructions in the actual file that's downloaded where the user will open the DMG, and then they'll be told, like, hey, you just right-click and open and bypass this pesky thing called Gatekeeper. And all of a sudden, the user has completely bypassed code signing checks and any further security mechanisms that are built upon that. We see this a lot, okay? And this is a really good example of social engineering where they're playing on human nature, where they're tricking the user into essentially doing the job of the attacker. Apple puts so much effort into increasing the security posture of these operating systems, but increased security posture necessarily leads to increased sophistication of attacks and vulnerability exploitation. Which takes us nicely on to the next topic, vulnerabilities. Uh, within, uh, or just a level set, a software vulnerability is a flaw or a weakness in code that results in unintended uh, behavior. Very uh, commonly innocuous, safe unintended behavior, but sometimes not, uh, and creating a, poten a potential risk that an attacker can exploit to perform unauthorized actions on, uh, on the, like, within the actual software or on the host itself. Uh, vulnerabilities range in, in severity from very safe, very okay, all the way up to you know, when this happens, this is very, very bad, uh, and can be both in a, a powerful initial attack vector or a critical link in the attack chain from kind of stepping from step two to three. Uh, in 2022, just over 450 new vulnerabilities for Apple platforms were uh, reported. This might seem like a lot, uh, it's actually uh, uh, not, you know. Many of these were very low severity. Uh, uh, Percentage-wise, it's actually not that many compared to other platforms, and it was a downward trend, a decrease of 23% from 2021. Uh, and in fact, there's actually been a downward trend since 2015. Uh, and if I think back to, so I've been a jam for roughly about 10 years, so kind of working in this space, that's very much the period with, uh, from which Apple, at least from my perspective, really started to take Mac and the enterprise very, very seriously, starting to invest a lot of time and effort and resources in, in building up the security of that platform. And I think consequently, you could draw a pretty good line from that focus to that downward trend since 2015. Now, CISA, the, uh, oh, I forget the acronym, uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, it's a bit of a mouthful, in the US reported that only nine zero-day vulnerabilities were known to be exploited in 2022, uh, spread across macOS, iOS, and other platforms due to shared technologies that, that appear across all of them. Uh, zero-day vulnerabilities are just software vulnerabilities that the vendor doesn't know about when they're first used. So vendors have zero days to patch them. They can be uh, particularly dangerous because there's no real good way to defend against them. You can mitigate. Uh, both the initial usage of them and also the impact, uh, but if, if a vendor doesn't know about them, they can't defend against them. 
The other type of vulnerabilities, which I perhaps don't think we talk about as much or enough, are known vulnerabilities, where they're exactly the same types of software vulnerabilities, except they're known to the vendor, they're known to the public, right? There's no difference. Uh, often there's a patch for them, often not. Uh, the risk here is that as soon as these vulnerabilities become known uh, to the public, often a proof of concept will be available to it, and then the, talk, the clock starts ticking from the, vul the vulnerability being known to then the vendor having time to actually build that patch to the organization having time to deploy that patch. Uh, the risk there is that threat actors often, very often act quicker than vendors and certainly act quicker than a lot of organizations uh, kind of managing these operating systems. Now, that's where Apple's implementation of the rapid security response uh, feature within the kind of later operating systems is really, really powerful, okay? It, it, uh, ra uh, kind of significantly shortens the mean time to patch, the mean time from uh, there being a vulnerability that's known, an exploit being available, and, and a patch actually installed, because these uh, updates can be installed in flight without requiring the device to, uh, to actually restart to enforce. So another really significant step forward. So moving on from the attack vectors and just talking more in general again, threat actors have a rapidly expanding attack surface. Uh, it includes any IT asset connected to the internet, whether that's applications, IoT devices, uh, cloud platforms that threat actors could infiltrate and exploit to perpetuate an attack. Uh, a company's attack surface really faces a barrage of daily attacks and uh, any external network vulnerabilities could open the door to a potential breach. What I wanna hit home here is that uh, we can take some really fundamental, simple, but powerful steps to actually increase the security posture of your environment with the goal of managing and reducing the attack surface of your Macs. Uh, this is one of two slides that I would say if you were gonna take notes from or do anything else like picture, this would be the one that I would take it from. I've tried to break it down into th really kind of three sections. The first one being hardening and protecting your devices. Uh, the first one is manage and monitor built-in Apple security. So as we said, Apple puts a lot of time and money and effort into actually uh, increasing the built-in security posture of these devices with tools like Xprotect, Gatekeeper. Uh, but often, while these have very high capabilities, they're not always turned on by default out of the box, or they're not managed in a way that the user can't disable. Okay, so configure these devices properly with an MDM solution, monitor the activity so that even if Xprotect protects against a piece of malware, you should still know about it. You should still understand how that piece of malware got onto that device and be able to understand what else happened in that, in, in that attack. Create and enforce compliance baselines, okay? And so this one is also about making the most of built-in security on, on the devices. Outside of the really security-focused tooling, uh, there's a lot that we can do within the operating system to protect the users from themselves, okay? Stop the users from invoking operating system functions that might make them or the system more vulnerable. Work through uh, things like the Jam Compliance Editor, work through Jam Protect, uh, do research with the Mac Security Compliance Project to understand how a Mac device should be hardened, and then build your baseline enforce it with MDM and track it within, within your solution to ensure you're making the most of those built-in security functions. And finally, I think through uh, some of the threat research we showed earlier, it should hopefully be a little bit clear now as to why a really Apple-focused security solution on your Macs is uh, more than valuable. Second up is defending and empowering end users. So we want to protect against phishing regardless of the platform that the user is using when they receive it, uh, what service that they get it from, whether it's an email or uh, an SMS or Instagram or something else. Implement a, just a basic but fundamental and powerful phishing protection to just take a massive amount of risk straight off the top. Uh, educate users with security awareness training. So as I mentioned, it's our job uh, within IT and security to prepare users, to train them. We protect them with solutions that we have in place, but we should also be empowering them to spot and implement their own protection when the opportunity arises. It's also really important that in these situations that we don't ignore return to service workflows. A really critical step is obviously implementing something that stops you know, uh, something bad happening, but you can't just stop there, okay? If you simply cut off a user from using an application or navigating to a website, you've protected against the threats, but you've also stopped that user trying to do something that theoretically should be productive in their day job. So it's really important to also consider how can we 
protect against something, but then allow the user to get back to their job, get back to their pro uh, productivity, and keep doing the thing that they're there to do. Third category is all about software or third-party software on the device, approving and patching software. So patch fast, patch often, and ideally with automation. I think the Jamf app installers are a really good example there. Uh, the most secure operating system or piece of software uh, you know, in a perfect world should be the latest version, okay? Uh, specifically with, with operating system updates from Apple, each and every one of those has a bunch of really critical security enhancements. Uh, often after release, those are actually, uh, the details about those or some of them are published online in, in Apple's release notes, so it's a really good uh, reason to make sure we're patching as fast as possible. In cases where we can't use automation, prioritizing higher risk software that's on the endpoint to ensure we are patching those manually. Uh, a really good example of a higher risk piece of software is a browser, where all the risk of the end user, all the risk of kind of software vulnerabilities and all the risk of just the internet in general all come together and create this kind of terrible situation for a defender in that uh, these are concerning, so the best that you can do to ensure these are patching themselves automatically or you're catering for that with your workflows and you're prioritizing those sorts of tools, the better. And finally, we can't, detect and prevent everything, all right? That's not how this works. There's no, there's no perfect security solution. So in cases where we can't anticipate something, it's really important to have mitigation strategies in place, okay? So having the ability to have your device or your user lose access to sensitive business applications and data in the, in the situation where their device risk goes above a certain level, really, really important mitigation strategy. So even if something did occur on that device, you've limited whatever that happened, or whatever's on that device from accessing what you don't want it to. Finally, uh, we talked a little bit about there about what we can do with kind of the tools that are the tools that I think a lot of people in this room will have available. There is a really big asymmetry, though, between attackers and defenders, right? All those things on the screen, they're around alert fatigue, uh, complexity of security ecosystems growing, knowledge and skill gaps being harder to fill. A lot of things are playing in the favor of attackers. Uh, so what Jamf is trying to do is trying to identify what are as many different ways that we can help our customers either with ch making changes behind the scenes or making changes such as releasing a new capability that allow a customer to solve a problem. First of all, at the start of the year, we uh, really simplified our product portfolio to try to make it as easy as possible for customers to understand you know, what solutions were available, what could they be using, what do they own, how do they implement it. And we ended up with uh, Jamf Protect and Jamf Connect on the security side. I went through all of our release notes in, in the security kind of uh, products over the last 18 months and pulled out only all the major releases across all the security capabilities at Jamf, and I put them all on the screen here. The goal being that you could pick any one of these, take it home, and try to implement it next week, and you'd be doing something to simply increase the security posture of your environment. This was the hardest thing to build in the presentation. This took me hours. Um, not even finding it, arranging everything in the way that my OCD let me. Um, each time I've presented this talk, and I've, I've, I've done it a few times, the feedback I get is that this is the most valuable slide, right? You could almost build, not a full roadmap of things that you can do to improve your environment, but things that you can have along the way, right? Uh, these are some things that we've done. Some things that we have uh, kind of recently released are vulnerability reporting for Mac and mobile within Jam Protect. Uh, I was talked a little bit about uh, in the keynote this morning. The goal here is to help you understand what your highest value opportunities are for reducing vulnerabilities within your environment for Mac and mobile platforms, both within the operating system and now for third-party apps as well. Uh, this is really, really valuable. Uh, often, you know, customers will be using a whole other solution to get this sort of visibility, and we're now bringing that just straight into your Jamprotect licensing. We've also released the compliance baseline refresh for macOS Jamprotect. Uh, this is the insights feature, or we're actually about to release this, I should say. Uh, this is the insights feature that we're bolstering, we're refreshing, and we're adding a whole range of new visibility within the product to help you track how well you're doing against those baselines that you're establishing. Uh, again, the goal here is built-in security, uh, and there's a lot more to come. This is very much the first step of a much bigger effort, uh, so please, we'd love to hear from you around how you receive this sort of update, but also what are the other kind of biggest uh, problems that you're wanting us to help solve in the compliance area.
Was it that bad? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, lucky for them. <laughs> uh, thanks for listening. Uh, hopefully this was helpful. And I think we have time for Q&A. Yeah, thanks, Matt. That was wonderful. So we have five questions so far. Uh, so if you have any other questions that uh, you want to ask, ask, go ahead and throw them in the app. We'll start off with a question from Tina. What is the difference between Jamf Protect, Jamf Security Cloud, and the Jamf Trust app? <laughs> Great question. Uh, so all of those things are their own things. So the Jamf Trust application is an on-device client that goes on your Mac and mobile. It's not a product. It's the way that we deliver features and capability onto those devices. It's what your end users will interact with. Uh, Jamf Protect is the product that you would buy that offers some capabilities within Jamf Trust. You also get some through the Jamf Connect product as well. And Jamf Security Cloud is uh, the, it's actually one of, unfortunately, a couple terms that we use to refer to the mobile and network security portal, uh, sometimes also called Radar, uh, where users can access some Jamf Protect functionality and some Jamf Connect functionality as well. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we got a question from the Iron Giant. Love that username. That was one of my favorite movies as a kid. Uh, and I actually get this question a lot, uh, so I'm excited to hear your answer. Uh, how does Jamf Protect handle data loss prevention issues? For instance, if an employee suddenly starts taking a bunch of screenshots and then leaves the company, what could you do to identify it? And are there any active countermeasures against it? Great question. Someone's been reading Reddit. Um, yeah, so. Uh, we have a lot of kind of DLP-esque capabilities within the product. I'll start by being completely upfront. If anyone is chasing a true, you know, start to finish DLP solution, that's a very specialized area, uh, and we, we, we don't brand our capabilities as that. But we do have a lot of capabilities that fit within that realm. So screenshot monitoring, totally capable with, with, with Mac OS. USBs, um, so file transmission to removable storage devices, monitoring and control of that, all totally possible within Jam Protect. There's a bunch of different things that we can do with our custom detection and logging uh, on, on, on the Mac side specifically, but there's also a bunch of different DLP kind of capabilities or uh, features that are provided by actually MDM uh, and that we can do on the mobile side through networking as well. So there's a lot there. Uh, definitely whoever asked that, come catch me afterwards and we can kind of run you through that. It's an area that we are really wanting to talk to customers about right now. It's a, you know, it's a huge area of interest. There's a lot to discuss. DLP means, DLP means different things depending on who you're talking to. So we'd love to learn more about what the problems that you are interested in and how, and how we can help solve them either with the technology that we've already got or with something that we might want to build. Uh, Binder Tech says, is there any data on how willing macOS users are to possibly have a degraded user experience and the benefit of security versus Windows users? Or are any other data between the user groups? Uh, no data, but in my experience, very unwilling. <laughs> um, I think a big key thing there is that often Windows devices that people are given are the ones that their organization forces them to use and that helps them maybe be a little bit more okay with the fact that it isn't operating exactly how they'd want it to. But almost exclusively, people choose Apple platforms at work because it's what they use at home, right? And they expect that really um, smooth, intuitive, uh, uninterrupted user experience that they get on those devices, and they want that at work as well. Uh, one of the very, very primary reasons customers come and talk to us about Protect is the uh, elegant and de uh, native design of the software on macOS. A bit of an ethos that we have is that we try to make endpoint security so elegant in its design and implementation that users just think it's part of the Apple operating system. Right? So that is a guiding principle that, that flows through everything that we do with Jamf Protect. Um, and I'd say that's probably fair to say everything that we do with Jamf, but that's definitely one of the main reasons people uh, either come to us in the first place or look to transition away from other tools that they're using. Speaking of other tools, uh, Brennan says, thank you for your presentation. I know that you represent Jamf, but in all transparency, what other Mac-first security solutions do you compete with? We are considering Jamf Protect as a pro and connect customer today. That's, that's a very tricky question. Yeah. Um, I, like Mac-first <laughs> security solutions. I mean, that's, that's the rub, right? Like, it's um, Apple-first or Mac-first security solutions are really few and far between. There are a couple out there. 
Um, but I'm probably not going to get up on stage and tell you their names. Um, but in general, like a lot of big competitors that, that we do come up against and customers wanting to uh, work out how we fare against them would be, you know, Microsoft is a huge one. You know, they're a massive partner of uh, Jams, uh, probably our second after Apple. Um, but we do definitely compete against their endpoint security solution. We have obviously some of the other big ones in, uh, in the space like CrowdStrike. Um, but I think what sets us apart is that Apple first, Apple best approach, both in the technology that we build, but also you saw on the slides before, the threat intelligence and the threat research that we create as well. And they're kind of two separate pillars in the solution. Awesome. And then uh, finally, Tina has a couple questions. First, I'll ask both of them because I think they might kind of go together. Uh, what is the difference between Jamf threat defense and Jamf executive threat prevention? Um, but also, what is the difference between Jamf protect network threat prevention and Jamf threat defense? Isn't this a duplication as Jamf threat defense already provides network threat data or detection, excuse me, for Mac in addition to iOS, Windows, and Android? Yeah, so we need to get better at naming. Clarification. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we acknowledge we, we, we have some improvements to do on our name. <laughs> um, so first of all, Jamf Threat Defense is an older product line that was just for mobile. Uh, Jamf Protect is the now the kind of all-encompassing product that you buy for Mac and mobile uh, that is both on device and in network protections. Uh, there's kind of obviously the different components of that, but that's like the all-encompassing SKU uh, or the product license that you buy. Uh, the difference between executive threat protection and threat defense that's, Again, threat defense, the old one is more focused on the networking side uh, and understanding kind of network-based risks or app-based risks, whereas executive threat protection is for, uh, it's very much more focused on uh, kind of uh, endpoint detection and response specifically on the mobile by analyzing kind of um, artifacts on the device uh, and mostly focused in situations where the, the, the owner of that device is a high value target, like someone who works for a government or a journalist or things like that. So quite different um, use cases there. Uh, and the network threat prevention versus threat defense, I think it was? I think so, yeah. So network threat prevention is the Mac OS network security capability uh, and threat defense again is that kind of older product SKU and we're actually in an effort to make all of this simpler, rebranding network threat prevention as web protection that will work across Mac and mobile. So we are very aware that there's improvements here that we can make and we're trying to make those. Um, yeah. Awesome, that's all the questions we have on here. Any in-person questions by anyone who maybe wasn't able to get on the app for any reason? We do have a couple minutes left. The lights are very bright. I don't think I'm missing anyone, but Going once, great, awesome. Well, let's give uh, Matt a hand one more time. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, enjoy the rest of JNUC and uh, we'll see you around. <laughs>